Welcome to This Is Getting Old. I'm your host, Melissa Batchelor, and today we're going to be talking about bladder infections and to treat or not to treat in older adults. And I'm joined again by Jamie Smith, who's co-author of Geriatric Notes, which is a practical, um, small, up-to-date guide that's specific to helping people in geriatric medicine. So welcome, Jamie. So if you will just introduce yourself, um, do that, and then we'll get we'll dive into bladder infections. Hi, everyone. My name is Jamie Smith. I'm a nurse practitioner. I work full time with Premier Geriatric Solutions. I'm the director of education. Been a nurse practitioner for about eight years. Prior to that, I worked in the ER, ICU, med surge, about five years as an RN. And I am the author of Geriatric Notes. Happy to be here. All right. So first of all, let's define what a bladder infection is compared to um, asymptomatic bacteria or bacteria. You say it. <laughs> okay. Okay. So urinary tract infection is when you have an infection of your genitourinary tract. It can be your bladder, your kidneys. Um, and so you have a positive urine, but you also have symptoms like you're burning with urination, your dysteria, urgency, frequency. You may have super pubic pain, flank pain, gross hematuria, where your pee like turns different colors, like, like a pinkish or like even like a reddish color. You may or may not see that in your, in your urine, but you'll see it in like the urinalysis. And so asymptomatic bacteriuria is when you have a positive urine culture, which can be misleading because you may have a positive urine culture, but uh, you got to keep in mind that just because there's white cells there, uh, you can sometimes see that with uh, atrophy. Um, and so it's not always indicative of a urinary tract infection. You may also have contamination. So colonizes where you've got this positive urine, but you lack your typical genitourinary symptoms like you would see with the UTI. And it's extremely important to differentiate between UTI versus the colonized state because when you give antibiotics in older adults, that increases your risk of C. diff, antibiotic resistance, drug to drug interaction, increased healthcare cost. And so it's super important to differentiate the two. And it's not always straightforward because in long-term care, patients sometimes will have cognitive impairment and they can't always tell you if there's symptoms there. So then I have to lean on my staff to tell me, you know, is she peeing more than usual? Um, is there grimacing when she urinates? Have you noticed discolored urine and so forth? And so I also try to differentiate because even if they've got got dysuria or burning urination. The other two differential diagnoses you have to think about is atrophic vaginitis and um, interstitial cystitis, also known as painful bladder syndrome. So figuring out if the burning urination is new versus if you've had it for a while can also help you figure out if this is a true UTI versus something else. Okay, so how, what are some of the different things that you use to differentiate? Like if you- Okay, to... okay. So I'm a member of AMDA, and so they actually have a flip manual. Um, it's uh, the urinary tract infection, and at the, at the back end of it, there's actually a one-pager I use and I give to my staff. I call it the watch list, and I'll have them fill it out for me, and it helps me figure out if this is a true UTI versus colonized state. They'll look for if they're urinating more than usual, if there's anything abnormal going on, we'll look at vital signs to help us out. So to look for elevated heart rate, elevated temperature, because a lot of times they're not going to have your typical textbook symptoms of a UTI. Sometimes I will even get a white blood cell count to help guide medical decision making. And sometimes I'll get a procalcitonin because that'll let you know if it's acute active bacterial infection right here, right now. I reserve that though, if the patient's confused, can't really tell you, and I've ruled out other stuff. I always try to rule out other stuff first though. So like if they wanna get a urine based off of confusion, I always do basic stuff first, like looking for, for any new meds that have started. I don't automatically go towards a UTI thought process. Okay, so what are some of the differences you see between kind of how this is treated in the hospital setting compared to long-term care? That is a good question. So here in Southwestern Virginia, anytime we have a patient go out, like a family member requests, you know, for their mom to go out because they're confused. One of the first things the ER does, they, they'll check the CBC, a uh, basic metabolic panel in a urine. Even if the urine has trace amounts of bacteria, and let's say the patient's confused, but not so totally confused that they can't tell you if there's any genitourinary symptoms, here in Virginia, at least, I will all the time see, they'll go ahead and get prescribed an antibiotic. 
and um, that's different than long-term care because if they can tell you if they're having symptoms and they're not having any symptoms that's treated, uh, associated with your genitourinary tract, then that's classified as colonized and we don't treat that because we look at the McGreer's criteria, Lev's criteria, and um, if they don't qualify, we don't treat them because of the risk of harm with giving them an antibiotic. So is there anything else that a provider needs to know about yeah. asymptomatic bacteria? So I think it's important to know that asymptomatic bacteria in long-term care is more common than actual urinary tract infections. Men, about 35 to 40% of men in long-term care have it, about 50% of women have it, and that's even higher for women with urinary incontinence. So it's important to keep that in mind. When you see a positive urine culture, don't automatically assume it's a UTI. You got to make sure you look at your patient, look at the symptoms they're having before you give them an antibiotic. Always keep in mind that the antibiotic can increase the risk of, like I said earlier, risk of harm, antibiotic resistance, C. diff, cost, and drug-to-drug -drug interactions. So, yeah. That's important. Okay. Well, again, um, your book is Geriatric Notes. I think you have a copy if you want to hold it up. Here's mine too. <laughs> we both have it. Um, and we'll include a link on, uh, on my website for people to pick up a copy. And I think you have a promo code for them. I do, Geriatric. You save 20% free shipping. It's the best price out there, better than Amazon. Okay, so that's great. So we'll have that link at melissabphd.com on your episode of the podcast. So thank you so much for being with me today, Jamie. And it's been very nice to meet you. And I wish you the best uh, with your book. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining me for this week's episode of This Is Getting Old, Moving Towards an Age-Friendly World. You can find more episodes like this on my YouTube channel, Melissa B. PhD. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also visit my website, melissabphd.com, and check out the podcast and blog section because that's where I put all the hyperlinks and different things that we may talk about in any given episode. You can follow me on social media, um, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. And you can also find the audio version of the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Amazon Music. So I hope this podcast gives you ideas of different things that we can do to move towards an age-friendly world because when the world is age-friendly, it's friendly for everyone.